Hey family, thank you for tuning in to Our Roots Podcast with Joseph Babaifa. We're only the strongest roots see the light, brought to you by Botanica Candles and more. And if you haven't had the opportunity, please subscribe and be sure to like and share this video. You guys asked for it. Here it is, Orishas in Nature, Part 2. We got a great response from this video initially and definitely had to come out with a Part 2 to go over some of the more obscure ones that we weren't able to touch on initially, Phil. Yeah, this is one. This is going to be probably one of my favorite series of episodes that uh, we're going to do because you know if you are new to Ifa, I think this is something that could definitely be beneficial for you as well. Yeah, especially understanding that Ifa is a nature based religion and kind of understanding what that means and why we have those concepts. But each Orisha has a different space that they occupy. You know, as we went over in the first video, we went over the more popular people or the ones that are more, you know, commonly sought after. But, you know, my real enjoyment is talking about some of these more obscure characters because they get into the parts of, uh, of nature and geography that most people wouldn't think about. Now, how, how do some of these uh, Orishas get to be more obscure than somebody like Shango or Obatala? Well, um, I think the archetype has a lot to do with it as well. When you look at um, a system such as Isheshe, where you don't necessarily ask the oracle which Orisha you're initiated into, you kind of go with which one kind of resonates within your sign. Um, Most men want to be like Shango. You know, he's, yep. he's corpulent, he's, he's, he's viral, he's all these different things. Um, so a lot of people would initiate into that mystery. Um, most women want to be like Oshun, you know, uh, a lot of love, a lot of, um, you know, uh, attractiveness, all these different things. Um, what I loved always about our system is that it keeps it fair. You know, if, it, if you don't come from a lineage of one of these uh, deities, you kind of, it's kind of like the sorting hat in Harry Potter. Mm, you know, okay. you go here, you go there. Um, but also another reason they become a little more obscure is a lot of these Orishas are actually older than the popular ones. Um, you know, we talk about people like Agayu and Oloku. These were deities and energies that were present at the dawn of existence. Um, and also the places they occupy. You know, they're not as popular. Where Shango sits at the top of a palm tree, um, Agayu's in a volcano. So most people aren't going to be like, yeah, I'm rushing to get initiated in Agayu if I don't have to, you know? <laughs> yeah, so how would you even... <laughs> you know, it's, unless you're born right next to the mountain or in the desert or wherever, you know, Agayu's cult comes from, most people will be like, yeah, I'll go with the palm tree guy, you know, or let's go to the river or, you know, by certain parts of the ocean, places that are a little more attractive. So that's why I've always liked, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an underdog kind of guy. I'm a Rocky Marciano kind of guy. So like these, these Orishas, when I got over the popular ones and I started learning about these guys, I realized there was a lot more information here that, that more people would give credit to. And it actually helped me separate myself because learning more about the obscure deities makes you more valuable because everybody wants to learn about the story of Oshun, Shango, the infidelity, all this, you know, this Jerry Springer stuff. Mm-hmm. But when we get into, um, you know, some of the more, you know, um, obscure Orishas, you, you find really great information and wisdom from each of them. Okay. So you have one, um, you want to, Get started. I mean, you mentioned Agayu, so I mean, let's... Uh, yeah, let's, and Agayu holds a dear place to me. He's my father in Odisha, because when you crown Odisha, you get a counterpoint, right? So um, Agayu is is my counterpoint to Oshun. I'm initiated in Oshun, and Agayu was identified as my father. And ironically, I, I never thought that would be the case. I was going to actually ask for, you know, I don't know, maybe Baba Luaye or Dudua, uh, maybe even Shango, just because my mother's a daughter of Shango, like my grandmother was. But um, they asked for Agayu for me on the first try, and he came out. So, um, you know, I break things um, on accident quite a bit, and, you know, I occupy quite a bit of space. So really? It, yeah, it made, a, it made a lot of sense. You know, everybody knew it but me. I, maybe I was in denial. But um, Agayu is associated with, um, most popularly, the volcano. But there have been some debates um, how, you know, in Africa, ancient Africa, there really weren't any volcanoes, right? So Agayu's actual, you know, positions, um, not that the volcano is not, but is more the mountain, the desert, as well as the trenches um, within the ocean, like the tectonic plate movement and all of these different things. Because, you know, it's the only way we can interpret a volcano going back that far to the cradle of civilization that Africa is. Um, there's a couple of different, you know, patakis that touch on why Agayu is involved in all of these different, uh, spaces. So when we look at, for example, an Odu like Baba Odu Rameji, 
Um, in the Odu, Baba Otura Meji was where the Babalawos were trying to move a mountain, right? And um, obviously, by force, they weren't able to do so. So they performed divination where this Odu was revealed, where Ifa said they needed to make offerings um, to the mountain to be able to actually have it move, right? So when they made the offering, nothing happened anyway. And they became very frustrated, and Eshu was actually walking by, and he laughed at them. And he said, and they said, why do you laugh at us? He said, because you forgot the magic words. And when they did that, Agayu came out and actually moved the mountain. Some people would say Agayu was the mountain that just decided to kind of shift over. Okay. Um, but in that Odu is identified why when we deposit a bows, especially through Ifa, we say Iboru, Iboi, Ibochiche, which loosely translates to um, I'm able to have influence, I'm able to make sacrifice, I'm able to cause change. Um, and those are the, the, the names of the wives of Orumila, um, and each of their translations were such. So that's why Agayu was ultimately identified with these huge, monstrous expressions of geography, whether it be a mountain. And every mountain has the capability of becoming a volcano, depending about, you know, you look at Mount St. Helens and, you know, what just happened now. And I believe it was a Hawaii or a Samoa. Yeah, and, uh, and Iceland just recently, too. Yeah, I heard about another one. Yeah, like Agayu really gets... Uh, he gets very he gets very fierce, you know, as far as a deity, and that's why you know the Agayu to me is part of a group of Orishas that I like to call like the Titans. When you look at like Greek mythology, before the gods came around or the Olympians, as they were known, the Titans were present, which were like these prehistoric ancestral energies that had to do with the basis of existence. Like Kronos, and exactly right, and all these uh, all these different you know the the giants, the Cyclopses, all the people that little by little Zeus started getting under his command. So Agayu was part of the old guard, right, from an Idomole energy standpoint. Um, so that that's one position. Um, apart from that, he's associated with the river as well. Um, and, and the river story isn't the most flattering. Um, what occurred was is Obadala's wife, Oshanla, actually had to get across the river one time. And um, Agayu was the boatsman. And, you know, um, she didn't have any money. And he said, well, what can you offer me? And uh, she said, well, I have nothing more to offer than myself. And they actually had an encounter. And um, from it was born Shango, right? So, you know, Badala knew when Shango was born, he's like, this isn't my kid, but, you know, I'm going to raise him. You know what I'm saying? He's, uh, I, I love him regardless. But, you know, rumors started going around and people started mentioning how Shango looked absolutely nothing like Obatala <laughs> as opposed to his other children. And, um, you know, he went to his mother looking for answers and his mother directed him um, to the mountain or the volcano. And Shango had to actually cross the same river. And when he actually delved into the depths of the mountain, he found his father, which I, which struck Agayu because he's like, how is this kid able to handle this temperature? And Shango said, you're my father. And Agayu didn't want to recognize the paternity. And he basically blasted him with magma, and Shango was impervious to it. He said, well, yeah, you are my crimson, right? You are my, you are my child. So you see how he kind of delves into all these different spaces. Now we're talking about the volcano. We have the river. The Odu Obarasa speaks of when Agayu came down from the volcano into the river to be able to relax, where his son Shango and, his wife, and uh, Shango's wife, Oshun, were able to become Agayu's representatives. Um, he has to do with the desert and the minerals and the rocks and things like that because Agayu and the Odu of Baba Oturameji would actually cross the desert in one step. Some people would loosely um, translate his name to my eyes see everything, and it makes reference to his stature and his capability to travel. Mm. Man, that reminds me of uh, Heimdall. Who's that? Heimdall is a Nordic thing from um, like Thor and stuff. Oh yeah, I haven't he read can, that mythology he can in a see while. Everything and he can try make you know people travel fast. Yeah, and you see all these archetypes between all these old uh, you know mythologies and all these old accounts because there has to be central energies for existence uh, to exist and be. And it really was just influenced by culture as this information and people started emigrating from Africa, you know, to Southern Europe, Scandinavia, you know, the Middle East, all these different places. It, it, it suffered cultural influences, but the energy and the archetypes were still the same. So that's why you see all those counterpoints, you know, being so similar. I love I love that, you know, since our, our journey and for our roots has started, I've learned that's been a year right way over that wow uh, it'll be two years this year that's wild. um since we started i've learned so much and how many things connect to ipa yeah 
And I, I, lo- I love that. So if you guys hear me mention like an obscure reference, like I just mentioned, like Heimdall from Thor, don't come at me in the comments. I mean, you can, but that's an awesome <laughs> name, by the way. Shout out to Heimdall and all the, the Norse gods, man. Shout out to Loki, <laughs> who's <laughs> nothing more than Eshu, you know. But yeah, that's uh, that's Agayu. And then you know, you look at the tectonic plates, and some people even interpret that Agayu was the the deity who kind of separated the continents and things through you know the various explosions oh. and tectonic plate movement. Um, that's why you say he was there in the beginning, because when you look at the trenches, I mean, they're at the bottom of the ocean and the magma. And as you're going into the, what is it? The crossed mantle core of what is this, this, this globe, um, I got you was there, you know, to be able to, you, I mean, a, a mountain is nothing more than a, a, a medit- like, um, an aquatic explosion that ultimately kind of over time builds upon itself and makes its way through the surface, you know, or, you know, they've identified that through the tectonic plate movement, the collision of both and the rising of it is what causes, you know, these, these, um, these, these, these spaces in nature, you know, that are mountains and hills and whatnot. So I got you was there for all of that. Right. Okay. All right. Who we got, uh, who we got next? Next, we're going to go ahead and do Baba Luaye. Um, San Lazaro, um, is an incredible Odisha. He's very popular, but when we talk about his spaces in nature, um, he actually, I have not read one pataki in the Afro-Cuban Lukumi text that doesn't end up with Baba Luaye living outside in the jungle. Mm. Um, you know, unfortunately when he succumbed to his, uh, his illness of leprosy due to an encounter with a random woman, um, as some versions would say, Everyone shunned him or kicked him out, you know, into the jungle. Um, so when we look at Odu's like Irete Oba, where Shang, where Babaluaye slept with Agayu's daughter, Obanani, not Obanani, forgive me, Dada. Um, and when he found out about the encounter and how he got his daughter sick, he kicked him out of the house, right, into the jungle where Shango beat him up. Um, you look at, you know, Odu's like Babao di Meji, where Babaluaye killed his brother Inle. Um, because Inle had children and was happy, and Babaluaye was bitter and hated children, they once he murdered his brother Inle, he they, he was shunned by Shango once again into the jungle. Um, so you, you see that quite a bit. But another really big reason why Babaluaye is associated with the jungle and the outdoors is because of the Odu Babao Gundameji was where he was identified as Babao De, which means father of the hunters, right? And Babaluaye. Um, in this manifestation, it was the most storied hunter ever. And, you know, he was at the point of retiring and all his prestige and glamour. And, um, you know, someone, and that someone was ultimately Eshu, disguised themselves and, and told Baba Luaya there was, there was a monster um, that he was going to be unable to conquer in the jungle. And Baba Luaya said, that's impossible. I've, I've hunted everything. You know, and he said, well, you haven't hunted this. So Baba Luaye went running to Orumila for divination where Ifa greatly opposed the idea of him going back out into the hunt to pursue more glory. You know, it was time for him to sit down. But he was too ambitious, and he chose to go anyway. And when he ran into this monster, which the scripture of Ifa really doesn't give him a description, um, but it sounds like a woolly mammoth just uber mutated Ooh, okay. and um it had telepathic abilities and it was actually communicating to Baba Luaye, uh mentally where he expressed i know who you are i know why you're here if you spare my life i'll give you the three things you want the most and he said you know i want to live forever i want more money and i want more women you know and um great deal great deal right for nothing and um you know he gave him those three virtues but Baba Luaye was so frustrated that this thing could give him more in a moment than he could have given himself in a hundred lifetimes he decided to kill him anyway and when he did that it was a very big mistake because the animal at that point let him know you will always be remembered as the destroyer of humanity and when the arrow hit, it actually caused, you know, this huge gash where death, sickness, loss, and all of the negativity started spewing out of it. And they hit Baba Luaye all at once, right? So he died, he got sick, he lost. He went through every single negative experience all at once. Um, and because of it, he was never able to return back to the village or back to humanity and society. So that's why he's ultimately associated with the jungle, you know? Um, also with Baba Luaye, another very important place for him is going to be the cemetery. In the Odu of Irete Unfa, 
or Hirete Alaye, was where Bawalu Aye became identified as the, um, I guess, what is the hearse? The, the driver of the hearse, I think, is the modern um, expression of it. But, like you know, a pallbearer? Almost? Al- almost. But there was a vehicle involved where Bawalu Aye would actually carry the bodies in a, a wheelbarrow type, contra- or type contraption and take them to the gate of the cemetery. He, that's what I'm saying. He was, he was kind of the chauffeur of the dead. Um, and you know, that, that's where he became associated with the cemetery, the process of death, apart from the story I mentioned with, uh, Baba Gundameji, you know, and, and ultimately another place you could loosely identify is, you know, a palace or a kingdom because Obaluaye means king of the world ultimately. Um, you know, and there's various stories where he was able to triumph and, and become regal. You know, if you look at the Odu of Barakosun, Shango made him king, um, in Iretekana, he became king of the land of Benin, right? Um, so, you know, very diverse guy as well. But um, the jungle, I mean, I haven't, you look at Isheshe practitioners in, um, in Nigeria, when they're initiates of Obaluayer, they have the icon, it always, li- it always lives outside. Um, because he's identified as Shakpana, which is uh, obviously the leprosy and the measles and all these different things that he has to do with. They don't want that in the house. They want to be able to offer it to him outside. So he's 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 known as uh, he's known as the father of outside. So, question for you is is Babalua like one of the most under uh, misunderstood Orishas? I, I would say yeah. I can't think of a more obscure one um, because he is he has that dichotomy where he's greatly loved and greatly feared. You know, they say I was reading some information recently that there was a big scare. Um, I don't know if it was like 50 years ago in Nigeria or something like that, where the Babaluaye priests were actually brought to justice because it says that they were doing um, abilu or witchcraft to infect everyone with like smallpox. There was a huge epidemic that happened over there at some point. And um, they actually were tried, you know, for performing spiritual work. I don't know how they were able to prove this, but, you know, it's a different culture, different society. And, um, you know, so it definitely added to that mystique of stay away, you know, but... um, I love him dearly. I've gotten some great results with that Orisha. And, and my sign is actually one of the signs where he went to uh, Dahomey and um, became king, you know, over there with Nanaburuku when he started his family and whatnot. So I've had great results with him. But there is always that air of, you know, respect. Like, he's not a deity. Like, a lot of people like to talk about Odudua and, um, you know, as a deity of respect. And, you know, even at Gayu to a certain point. But Babalua is just somebody... You, you know, you just you, you're very, very careful around because his, his character is volatile. Mm. OK. All right. You got anybody else in mind? Absolutely. Yeah, we got. Um, I don't believe we've gone over Oba yet. Oba? Yeah. Oba Nani. So we'll, we'll go over her now. Oba is the uh, the famous wife of Shango who cut her ear um, to try to, you know, entice him a little bit more. Oh, I remember this story. And uh, we yeah, tricked her. And because of it, Shango informally um, divorced her where she abdicated the throne and uh, went to live in the jungle, right? Which is ultimately the space she's identified with. Um, in various stories, in the Odu of Babao Beche, was where um, her sister Oshun felt bad about what was going on and uh, implored her husband, Orumila, to go and help her sister, which via divination with the sign he did, and he offered her a she-goat that caused her to be level again, you know, and be able to interact and communicate where she left the care of her children in the hands of her sister, Oshun. Um, you know, she's actually identified once again with that space in nature because um, it's where people, after they realized she wasn't with Shango no more, they went to try to court her. And um, who ultimately was able to was Ogun. Part of it um, was initiated by the vengeance he wanted to seek upon Shango, for stealing his wife, Oya, um, and o- Ogun, through, you know, mischief and witchcraft, was able to uh, defeat Oba in a wrestling match, causing her to fall on her back, um, where he took advantage and consummated the relationship right there. She slipped on some enchanted corn that Orumila had given him. Mm. Um, so once again, she was in the jungle there, and she's also identified with the forge, because in the Odu of Ogun Natrubong, um, and I believe in Ogun Nakete as well, she actually went to the forge um, to function with um, Ogun. I'm going to lean more go- towards Ogun Natrupon with that one, though. Um, so she she actually handled business there as well. Um, but Oba is another Orisha that's very, very linked to the home. 
um, simply because she was Shango's homemaker. You know, she would have all the conditions ready for him after he had been doing some regal business that day. Um, but she is seen as the Orisha of the home, um, you know, as, and, and the housewife, you know, and all the roles that are to be fulfilled um, by the female partner within a relationship. Um, so she, she has to do with all of those things. And obviously she's also a river deity, like all of the female Orishas practically are. Um, so, and some people say that after her divorce, she kind of went through her mourning process and her depression process at the foot of the river. Um, so very, very complex, um, Odisha. Well, yeah. I remember that story that you you told me about the, the ear thing. And that was, uh, pretty shocking. I think it was one of our top, uh, shorts. Yeah. I mean, fortunately, unfortunately, right. I mean, you know, it's spicy to say the least, but people were going through the same problems, you know, thousands of years ago. I actually had a, a commenter. Um, or a commentator the other day said that I had the story wrong. Um, you know, so it's, it's always interesting, but I've heard so many versions of that story, but the one that made most sense to me was Oya providing the betrayal because it made no sense to me that Oshun did it because if Oshun was the one who betrayed Oba into cutting her ear, why in the Odu of Obeche would Oba go be searched for by Oshun to mediate you know, the after effects, you know, because there's no story of Oya going and saving Oba. And, you know, the, the relationship that Chang'o and Oya had, it always made more sense to me that Oya was the one who betrayed um, Oba into doing this, you know. So I'll, I'll stick with that version. Okay. All right. All right. Who you got next on the list? So we've gone over Agayu. We've gone over Bawaluaye or Banani. Um, another, you know, obscure Odisha as well. I'll go over Olohu, actually. Um, why is Olokun identified with the ocean? Um, it, it's really interesting because when you look at the creation myth within the Odu of Baba Yobe, there's another one in Baba Yekumeji, but it's a little bit different. I, I go with a, all of these guys were around in the beginning, though. Um, Ayobe speaks of the Big Bang, the dawn of, of uh, existence and creation. Yekumeji was actually the oldest sign in existence, being that it's identified with um, the absence of light. You know, and Ofumeji was there as well. He he caused the combustion that you know created this this huge uh, this huge event. But in the Odu of Babayobe, it speaks of when Obatala came down, and the earth was already there. You know, but the thing is, it was just one big ocean marsh swamp situation, right? So Olokun was already there, and for the longest time, Olokun had free reign on this planet. You know, it was it was him. Agayu was down there, you know, in the trenches and whatnot. There's a couple even more obscure Odishas, like Aziza is an Odisha that has to do with, like, the air and the wind. Okay. Um, like, this, we're talking about, like, the very, very, very beginning. And, um, you know, Olokun ultimately, you know, manifested within it. And when Obatala came down and, um, and started, you know, spreading the land matter and, you know, the geology, you know, Olokun had a very, very, very difficult time with it to the point where he started innovating the tsunamis and trying to basically make his way on land or kind of trying to engulf um, all that was being created. And Obadala realized he had a very serious enemy very quickly. And what he did was, is um, he was able to lure Olokun close enough with the ambition of Olokun killing him and Obatala threw the chain on him that he had used to come down from heaven to earth. And the chain, the force of it, you know, the, the magnitude of the drop caused Olokun to be stuck to the bottom of the ocean. Um, so needless to say, the ocean still to this day belongs to Olokun, but in a way where we're able to still manifest life here on land. Um, so, you know, another space, believe it or not, that Olokun occupies is atmosphere. Um, in the Odu of Irete Oba, um, it speaks of when Olokun went to war with the sun. Mm. And some people would say it was with Olorun or God Almighty. And, um, you know, Olorun was trying to destroy Olokun. And Olokun, because Olokun was very misbehaved, he, he really had an issue with authority because he's like, the world is mine. I still own the majority of it. And he went for divination. This Odu was revealed where Ifa told him that he needed to perform sacrifice to become immortal. Um, and he also had to have better character. And when Olokun did this, you know, the sun beat down so hard on the water that it caused it to condense. But through condensation, the accumulation within, you know, the atmosphere and sky, the rains happened. And because of it, till this day, the ocean never runs out because of this process. So Olokun is ironically, you know, associated with all those spaces of the atmosphere and whatnot because there's moisture everywhere. Wherever there's water, Olokun is there. 
So, you know, very, very, it gets much more complex than just like, oh, look, the, the beach, you know, he's, he's much more than that. So really, you know, much more minute analysis of, you know, what it is to actually own the ocean or be there. Okay. That was, a, that was interesting. All yeah. Right. So Olokun, um, another Orisha that, you know, we have to look at as well is um, Ed Inle. You know, we look at Inle. That was the really pretty one, right? Yeah, Olo, uh, yeah, Ed Inle, Ed Inle was a very attractive man. But, you know, he wasn't soft by any means. Like, he was a very... He was a very capable guy. He was a hunter. He was a fisher. He was a doctor. He was Oshosi's godfather. Um, you know, married man. He was married to uh, Abata, um, who actually became Oshosi's um, basically adopted mother. Um, and he worked very closely with the Orisha Osain. So, you know, all these characteristics let you know that Inle was, uh, was a very intense guy, even though he was very methodical. You know, and he was a little, I would say he was a little more social than Ochosi. Ochosi was, Ochosi sometimes, people might not think this, he kind of reminds me of the new Batman. Okay. Yeah, he's very, Ochosi was very hermetic in, the, in that regard. You know, he was more to the business. Inle was a little, he wasn't as traumatized, so he was a little more open. You know, and if you remember, we interviewed, uh, you know, Prince Babalola. They're all initiates of Ed Inle yeah. um, over there in Ilobu. So, but when we talk about Inle, Inle is going to be associated with the jungle for sure because he was a hunter by trade. Um, you know, and if you look at the Odu of Baba Gundameji, it speaks of when Inle and Oshosi would go into the jungle to do, you know, their, their hunter business. Um, and their mother, Yemaya, really wanted to protect them and, and keep them from having any issues. And um, they didn't realize they had an enemy known as Tetanus. It has another name within the book, but it's been interpreted as, you know, Tetanus because it was an energy that lived on the end of uh, metal. And it wanted to infect them because, you know, they were utilizing him without providing him any offerings. Um, so being that her children didn't want to come in for a reading because they weren't trying to hear that, she performed the reading for them via Orula. The Odu Baba Gundameji was revealed where they performed a bowl basically as a, you know, an ancient vaccine to where when they did step on the piece of metal, that spirituality wasn't able to penetrate their bloodstream and cause them a very excruciating death. Oh. Um, so that's, you know, that's where in Ogunameji was where Inle and Ochosi were always in the jungle, right? Um, from a fisher standpoint, you know, he, he was always near the river. I mean, that's just uh, characteristic of Inle. There's actually an Odu known as Iroso du Alara, which actually associates Inle with the ocean as well. Inle is said to live at the juncture between the ocean and the river, right? That, that kind of point where those two spaces meet. Now, where he became associated with the ocean was in the Odu of Iroso du Alara, he was a physician. And he wanted to be able to cure humanity of all its ailments, right? So he went for divination with Orumila, where Orumila really begged him not to persist in this quest. And Inle was very passionate about his Hippocratic Oath. And he said, I have to go down to the bottom of the ocean to learn the secrets to be able to save us here. Now, when he went down, um, Olokun, you know, accepted him and taught him and you know, really took a liking to him. But one day Inle told Olokun, now I have to take all this information back and cure humanity. And Olokun said, well, um, you can cure them, but you can't tell them nothing. And he actually cut out his tongue, Oh, right? And um, when Inle came back, he was able to perform the work to a certain degree, but he wasn't able to teach anybody else it other than what Olokun, and in some versions people would say Yemaya, would allow. Um, so that's where he actually became associated with the ocean. He's associated with the river as well because when he was married to Oshun, he lived near the river. When he was married to Yemaya, he lived near the ocean, and that caused a big issue between both of them uh, because they were after the same guy. And, uh, you know, he kind of would fluctuate back and forth, you know, so it was, it was, it was a different situation. Um, so, yeah, the river, the ocean, the jungle, definitely the hospital, definitely, you know, the physician's office. Um, because he, he helped a lot of people and cured a lot of people with his knowledge of the herbs, which he learned from Osai and Olokun as well, and a very, very complex deity, but one that I like very much. How many Orishas are there again? Well, here's the thing. I was just, I was just thinking about that. The, the number officially is 401, oh. officially. But the, the interesting thing about it is the one represents infinity. So uh, what does that mean? We all have the capability of becoming Orisha. 
Now, not in the way that, you know, like a Shangor or Shun would. These are ancestral energies that were, you know, basically installed by Olodumare. They were selected heads. Mm. But, for example, the day Michael Jordan passes away, he's in Orisha. You know, may, he, may, may it be in 100 years. Um, because he's just, he's not going to be forgotten. You know, and that's really what the concept of Orisha is. You have to die to become deified or become a god. No one becomes god living, you know what I'm saying? And, and you could even look at that like with art. Or music sometime. You have some people who, you know, I forgot what painter it was. I think it was Van Gogh. No one paid attention to his uh, his work before he passed away. But when, you know, he passed, they were like, oh, my God, this is the best stuff ever. Or, you know, certain music artists and things like that where, you know, we have to go through this process of transition to be recognized. Um, so it's the same thing with the Orishas. But what, the point I'm getting to is, you know, within my family, I will be an Orisha. You know, hopefully I leave behind a good enough legacy and reputation to where, you know, maybe they'll sacrifice to Egung on my behalf. Maybe I'll get a rooster out of this whole thing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, but that's kind of what the concept is, is, you know, the one represents that, you know, it's it's never ending. You know, I, I read a quote one time that says, there's as many Orishas as there are, as there are grains of sand in the beach. Oh, that's what I'm saying is like, you know, and, and there's Orishas. I was actually speaking to a couple of Sheshe brothers. There are Orishas that are strictly town based, um, that aren't popular globally. Like you go to certain, and they're, they're intense, like energies that these people work with, but these were actually people that they offer to. And, you know, the Agungung masquerade has a lot to do with that as well. Um, you know, because when you pass away, you fall under that umbrella within your lineage and you're offered to through there as well. So, you know, it's just it's it's referent to it never ends. OK. Um, yeah. All right. All right. So we went over Inle. Um, another deity that, you know, is technically an Orisha that we don't focus on enough is a Gungu. Um, a Gungu is identified with the marketplace. That's where Gungun resides, obviously the cemetery and whatnot. But, you know, we've gone over that. The concept of cemetery is very foreign to certain African cultures, such as ours, the Yoruba, because you bury your loved ones on your compound or on your property, right? So, you know, the, the, the concept of the cemetery is applicable to Egun, but just in a different space and light because technically the cemetery is our backyard, um, so he's obviously identified with that due to it being the resting place of, uh, you know, the remains of our loved ones that have passed on. But um, they say when Egungun came down from heaven in the Oduo Bewenye, he arrived in the marketplace when he first came down. And when he came down in the masquerade and, um, you know, he started dancing and moving in a certain fashion, entertaining people. They started throwing money at him and offerings and the children danced and, you know, everybody was just very, you know intrigued by him so it is ironic because his mother is oya and the word oya means marketplace right that's why they say a gungung is the daughter the, the child of oya the son of oya because when he was born he was born into oya he was born into the marketplace and who was overlooking it shango his adoptive father but um they say that his legitimate father is actually orisha Oko. Um, and they say that because, you know, his feet touched the ground before anything within the marketplace, you know, as Shango overlooked. Mm. Um, so it's an interesting epic there. Um, but Egungun actually is more associated with the marketplace than with the cemetery per se, because the Yorubas have this concept that the marketplace is a, a place where spirits go um, to kind of fraternize with the living. You know, that's why Oya is associated with the cemetery, not because she goes in the cemetery. She represents the gate only. Um, you know, it's because, you know, it's, it's a place where the spirits go to kind of fraternize with the living. Hmm. Did we ever do the, I can't, sorry, I'm going to, I'm going to butcher this, but it's, isn't it the, uh, Ibeji? Ibeji? Ibeji. No, we'll go over them now. Definitely. And, um, you know, twins, it, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and the interesting thing about them is cause you know, people, everything is interpretive. Like, you know, when I say that every Orisha can be crowned, um, the popular ones, at least like when we look at a deity such as Ibeji, um, I've never heard of anyone getting initiated into Ibeji as far as from, uh, you know, uh, a similar context. Like if we were to crown Oshun or Shango, now mind you, you can receive the icon, but, um, when we're talking about the Ibeji, the Ibeji actually, I mean, if you look at the, the first set of twins ever was a pair of yams, Ifa says, 
That's why Nigeria has the highest per capita expression of, of twins within their society. And they say it's due to um, the yam being the base carbohydrate over there. And people consuming it so much, it causes that cellular division into twins. Oh, wow. Um, so based on that interpretation, they have quite a bit to do with the farm, obviously. Um, but the Ibeji, when you actually look at them, they, they really were everywhere a drum was. You know, their father, Shango, had the drums, and, and they took great advantage of them, and they actually learned the drum as well. Um, you look at a couple famous, you know, stories about them. For example, the great story of the Odu Oturadi, where, uh, you know, it really was Eshu, or that negative aspect of the universe. They, they called it Olosi, or Alosi, um, and basically the devil um, was trying to take over the world, and everybody got into a drumming competition with the devil and was losing. Uh, so the Beji, at least one of them, showed up and said, uh, I'll defeat you. And they started playing and, um, you know, and, and dancing really is what it was. It was a dancing competition. And when the devil would do a spin, one of the twins would hop out and one would hop in. You know, they'd tag team. And it got to the point where the devil was like, I can't outdance this guy. And when he failed, um, you know, and he basically, you know, accepted defeat is when they revealed themselves. And he said, man, the world is in good hands as long as there's ingenuity such as y'all's. So the Ibejis are really anywhere there, there's a party or a gathering or whatnot. Um, you know, that's why in our culture, at least within the Lukumi, and I'm, I'm sure they have some expression of it over there, you know, there's a party that's given to children in their honor. You know, all the, all the sweets and the the music and all these different things. Um, it's a way of honoring these deities that, um, that really, you know, saved earth at one point. And it's kind of a message to us, you know, uh, about optimism. You know, sometimes we look at the child mentality and think it's infantile when in reality we could probably learn a bunch from it. Um, so they actually are everywhere. Um, you know, there's a good time basically. Now, mind you, they also share a lot with Shango, like, you know, they're affiliated with the palm tree as well, just based on, you know, their father's uh, position in nature as well. So that that would be that with them. Okay, yeah, because I don't hear too much about the uh, Beji twins. They don't, they don't come out a lot. And the ironic part about it is a bunch of people receive them. Like, that's one of the first deities a lot of people receive um, because it, it's not a complicated ceremony and it provides a lot of benefit. But it's, it's a very popular deity, but as far as, like, consultations and things like that, I think I had a consultation last week where I actually marked something for them, but it had been the first time in the longest time. It's not a deity that first comes to mind because you got all these other titans in front of them, um, but you get great results with those guys. I think they're great. Okay. All right. Who we got next? So um, as far as Orishas, another one that we can go over is, like, Oshumari. Um, Oshumare is the, uh, he is the rainbow, right? Um, now when we look at the concept of the rainbow, the rainbow, um, is actually something that was installed as a promise, right? It was a promise to maintain humanity because, you know, we've gone over this. Um, this is not our first time here. You know, I think we're on our sixth or seventh, um, incarnation based on what Ifa says. Yeah. And really the, 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 the mode of employ that Olodum would use or Olodumare would use to destroy humanity was the flood. He loved flooding us to death, you know? Um, so they say that after the last one, when he promised not to do it again and just accept us as we are and allow us to kind of finish how our behavior would respond with, um, is when Oshumare kind of manifested as a promise, you know? That's why if you notice, if after a rain, um, when the sun hits that spectrum of light, you know, we get the rainbow. So when after the flood and when the sun came out again and new life dawn, um, that's when Oshumare manifested as a pact, basically, between humanity and its creator to not just get obliterated every time he got frustrated with us. So when we talk about Oshumare, we're talking about um, the snake, right? The, the rainbow is, um, is seen as actually a snake. And when you look at some of the species over there in Nigeria, Africa, you see these intricate, colorful patterns that uh, would almost reminisce upon a rainbow. But it represents eternal life. It represents hope. Um, and, and that's why Oshumare is associated with the rainbow. Ultimately, he's the Orisha that kind of ensures um, that tranquility and understanding between humanity and, and, and the Most High. Um, but, you know, basically anywhere the rainbow is, you know, and it's usually near water and usually under sunlight. So 
Um, that would be that Odisha as well. Not too, too much information on that one, even though it is very popular now. Um, it's always been very popular from what I understand in Brazil, especially within Candomblé and Umbanda and things like that. Very popular deity where a lot of a lot of information that we have on that energy has come from Brazil as well as uh, obviously Nigeria. Is, uh, is Osain uh, a really popular one? or Osain's it? the man. Okay. Osain's the man. The thing about it is Osain is, uh, is a little more selective over here in the new world because the cult of Osain is, um, is exclusive to, you know, men. Um, now what happens is when we talk about Osain, it's not that everybody can't utilize Osain, but the actual Osain icon as such within our practice is, is reserved for that demographic. And where did Osain become associated with the forest and the jungle and the herbs and whatnot? You know, there's a, there's a song for Osain that, that says, and I'm going to sing. Where it's saying we, he came from within Olokun. Osain and the herbs came from or about from within Olokun. And it makes reference to when the vegetation started creeping out of the ocean onto land. Right. And um, originally Osain was an ocean energy or deity, because, you know, when you talk about vegetation, seaweed, um, you know, even in the Odu Babao Beche, it says the first plants started growing out of the ocean um, and breaking through the surface onto land. Um, but when we look at the modern manifestation of Osain, as far as him being the forest and the herbs and whatnot, there, there's various Odus. I mean, in the Odu of Oshen Iwo or Osheo Wonring, um, was where Osain came down from heaven to earth um, and established himself on earth to be able to grow and propagate Ewe, or the plants as it's known, um, you know, which is a very popular Odu that, that's recognized by many. And then you have the Odu Baba Irosunche, which is actually where Osain went into the jungle and started picking up all the herbs and harvesting them um, in a, a, spe a very specific space. Um, you know, and that's when he became associated with the herbs and ultimately the distributor of them, even though he had to share them with everybody, they had to go through a process to be able to get them from him as well. Um, but every time you see Osain in any of our literature, he's in the jungle. He's a very hermetic figure. And the reason he really hates people is because, um, one time he was trying to flirt with Oshun. I believe this is in the Odui Wuri Yekun. And, um, you know, he kind of exposed himself to Oshun, and Oshun wasn't impressed. Um, so, that's you know, he, she wasn't impressed by what she <laughs> saw, and she told him, she said, uh, That's it? That's, <laughs> you know, if you were trying to have an, if you were trying to, oh, forgive me, if you were trying to have a, an effect or get a reaction, I don't think it's the one you want to get. And, um, you know, he was greatly embarrassed by this, and uh, he, he chose to only interact with his sons. Um, that's why he doesn't like to be around women um, or any you know, anybody that could be attracted to the male anatomy. Um, so, you know, that's why it's a very exclusive, selective uh, cult over here in the new world. But the interesting thing about it is, and it'd be a study I'd love to delve into further. I don't know what the, uh, the requirements for Osain are on the other side of the ocean. Now, mind you, I've, I've met men that have been initiated into the rites of Osain and, you know, have names like Osain this or Osain Ying is, is his formal name. Um, but I'd, I'd love to know what the criteria with women is. And I would love to know how things kind of differentiate. Cause at the end of the day, Osain didn't want to interact with women. Um, so it's really, yeah, he wanted nothing to do with them after Oshun broke his heart. He's like, I don't want none of because he never wanted to open himself up to another embarrassment like that. So, you know, he, he entrusted himself to Orumila and the male Orishas. And, you know, I would love to see how that kind of manifests over there. Are there legitimate female initiates based on scripture? Um, because in the new world, I mean, I, it's to the point with Osain, I'm even very selective about what amulets I mount for certain women, because if they have certain ingredients that are more like Osain male specific, I might not even give it to her just to protect her. Um, because once again, he wants nothing to do with them. Wow. Okay. Let's get, uh, let's get one more. I think another good one is the Odisha Oro, right? And it's not a deity. Spell that. Oro is uh, O R O. Okay. Okay. The full name is Oro Lewe, right? And the word Oro means noise or sound. 
Lewe refers to House of the Herbs, and it, it really is easy to see that this guy is associated with the jungle. The oral cult, um, one that I'm actually initiated into, um, is very exclusive, once again, to men. It is actually a subgroup of the Ogboni cult, right? So the Ogbonis um, are the judicious, you know, council of Yoruba society. Ogbong or Agbong um, refers to wisdom, you know, so they're seen as the wisest people in society. I have seen male and female initiates of this. Yeah. It, is a, uh, it is a clan that is very much focused on the worship of earth. Um, there's Lukumi literature that says that Odudua influences this cult quite a bit as well due to the judiciousness and Odua being the first Onife or king of Ife. Um, now, mind you, when these people pass judgment on people and, and some people are seen as uh, undesirables and have to be executed, who handles that is the gentleman in the oral society, right? And where are these executions taking place or these punishments taking place in the jungle, Right, because in the Odu of Obewenye, um, which is one I mentioned with Egungun earlier, was when Egungun came down into the marketplace. Now, Egungun and Oro are brothers. Now, before they came down from heaven, they made a pact that Egungun was going to go down first and make sure everything was good. Um, he was supposed to be back in nine days. Um, he was going to go c come get his brother to make sure he could come down as well and they could function on earth. But the problem was, is when Egungun came down, a party started, and he partied for nine days straight. Yeah. So Oro on the ninth day got nervous and went down looking for his brother. And when he went down, he saw him just having a ball with the people, and Oro flipped out. And They say he roared, right? And when he did, everybody got scared, even Egungun. And Egungun went into hiding, and Oro then took over Earth for the next nine days after that and then left into the jungle, right? Um, so it's, it's an energy that is strictly in the jungle. He's known as the captain of the dead or kind of like the supervisor of the afterlife. He's probably the most, he's probably the most terrifying of deities after Eshu, after energies like the Iamio Shoronga. Um, there's no one fiercer than this guy. He lives in darkness. He, he's only recognized by a noise, basically. Um, so, you know, and he's pretty simple because he's in either... The jungle, and technically the jungle to him is the cemetery because it's where people are, you know, executed. Wow. I mean, this this series could probably take, what? A couple Three, episodes. Yeah, several. Yeah, we have a couple because there's still a bunch of people to go. I mean, we haven't gone over Yewa. I'm probably going to do a whole episode just on Yewa because I've got some pretty good information on her. Um, you know, there's there's a bunch more. There's a bunch of, like, people like Ashikwelu, like, even these minor deities and stuff like that. It, it can be an ongoing thing for sure. Yeah, you got to you gotta help me with the spelling on some of these because you got to give me some grace here with these shorts because I'm trying to spell them correctly. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, so definitely. So if you guys see them and they're spelled incorrectly, that's, that's all my fault. So don't don't be like, oh, Joseph, you don't know what you're talking about. That's me. That's awesome. That's <laughs> awesome. Phil, Phil's half a bawala already, man. Um, well, you ready for some shout outs? Absolutely, brother. You're my elevator music. All yes. All right. Okay, guys. So if you are not a member of our exclusive club, what that means is you're missing out on live shows. You're missing out on early release content, special discounts on store merchandise, and more. We have three separate tiers. You can join. Just hit that join button below. And we're giving a shout out to some of our VIPs and super fans here. Yes. So VIPs to Stanley Gurley. Stanley, thank you. New. They're new. Awesome. Thank All you right. for joining. We got King Ofunza. Oh, shout out to, to Ofunza. How you doing, brother? We got Joel Despradel. Thank you, Joel. And we got Love of Marin. Oh, Ten yeah. months. Ten months. Oh, OG. And we got super fans. Yes. We got Tay Rot. Thank you. Living happily. As we all should be. And Kathy. Kathy, Bendicione. You guys know Kathy at the store for sure. Uh, yeah. A couple closing thoughts, guys. Botanicacandlesandmore.com is up and running for all your services and product needs. The store is open seven days a week and can be contacted at 407-440-2086. If you can't see us on video, be sure to check, check out the podcast uh, audio, which is doing quite well on all major platforms. My wife is a real estate professional. You're more than welcome to reach out to Miss Boroye for any questions you have about the market and possibly purchasing a home for your family. Um, greatly appreciated from all of us the support we're at 17,500 subscribers by the time this video um was made and you know uh, 
can be any more grateful, guys, as things are growing and progressing now into the new year. So from all of us here, Botanica Candles and More, Outreach Podcast, Joseph Babaifa, thank you. And until next time, see the light. Thank <laughs> you.